upcoming, we have a webinar uh, with Music Care and Pediatrics with um, Danielle Scarlett. And then we have a whole host of programs, as people might know, um, just to, for those that haven't heard, our conference is coming to Waterloo in 2024. Um, we did release in December, which is a few months ago, but as a reminder, our most recent virtual learning studio is the Teenage Brain on Music. Um, and uh, we have um, a masterclass coming up in May, which we'll announce later. You can always head back to our website at musiccare.org for more uh, information. Just to, also this, uh, this uh, webinar today will be recorded, just so folks know. And um, if you are interested in training, we have a lot of training going on at Music Care these days, more training than we've had in a long time. We've been very busy. <laughs> so um, we have a level three in May, Another level one coming up in uh, May as well, and a level two in June. So if you're interested in any of our training, please reach out to our website, musiccare.org. Go to the Learn section to find out more. And again, it's virtual training. And just to mention that the training is a pathway to certification as an individual. So this is just a, a look at our registry. And uh, registry includes organizations and individuals that have certified with us over time. And if you have any questions whatsoever about certifying as an individual or as an organization, please reach out to G Wortley at room217.ca or, of course, the amazing Tanya at T Albus at room217.ca. Um, Jill is our certified lead and Tanya is our business manager. So, um, a little bit, uh, we will start today. Again, we are talking about music in healthcare contexts. So we have Nick who will talk about the healthcare musician. He's going to um, talk to us about his work in the UK. And of course, Nick um, comes to us from the UK. He is a music based in Derbyshire playing bassoon, guitar and piano. He began his musical career as an orchestral manager working as a fixer, a librarian, a concert and a, a concert and stage manager. He left orchestral life in the year 2000 to establish Opus Music, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to providing music-making opportunities for people of all ages across the Midlands region. He's very active, of course, and offers trainings in the UK in a variety of different contexts, including, including music care training. Um, and we also have the lovely Dr. Sarah Rose Black, and she's been providing clinical care and psychotherapeutic support in a variety of settings, including hospitals hospices, long-term care, and community care settings. She uh, is a um, music therapist with Princess Margaret, but also has her own practice, Whole Note Music Therapy, where she is a practicing music therapist and psycho uh, registered psychotherapist. So um, what we'll do is today's webinar is a little different. We're going to have a, about a 15-minute presentation from Dr. Sarah Rose Black, who's going to focus on the music therapy element. Following that, we'll have about a 15-minute um, minute presentation from Nick Cutts, who's going to talk about healthcare music um, and musicians. And, uh, and then afterwards, we will facilitate discussion between both of them. So um, the floor is yours, Sarah Rose. Uh, thank you so much, Dawn. And thank you, Tanya. And thank you to everyone at Room 217 for hosting myself and Nick for this webinar. It's always a delight to speak about that, which I am most passionate about, which is music and health, but specifically music therapy. So I'm going to share my screen and take you through a little bit about what music therapy formally looks like in a hospital setting specifically. I think it's very important to start by acknowledging that music therapists work all across, not just the country, but the world in a variety of settings, in a variety of modalities, using a variety of techniques and tools. But generally speaking, music therapists across the world come with a very specific type of training. And typically that involves a university degree in music therapy, followed by a, a series of placements or an internship. And depending on what country you live in or where you're from, the training is slightly different, but the credential is um, recognized as such in different parts of the world. So I'd like to begin with a formal definition of music therapy. And this is our Canadian Association of Music Therapists definition, which tends to be a little bit on the long side, but I've highlighted the parts that I feel are most important. So I'll take you through it in its entirety. Music therapy is a discipline in which 
credentialed professionals like myself, certified music therapists, use music purposefully within therapeutic relationships to support development, health, and well-being. We use music safely and ethically, two other keywords, to address a broad spectrum of human needs within cognitive, communicative, emotional, musical, physical, social, and spiritual domains. Now, again, this is a broad definition, but the most important piece here is that music therapists are credentialed and we connect through therapeutic relationships to support different goals. These are a lot of broad words as well, but I really want to highlight the therapeutic relationship as being paramount in what music therapists do. We connect, build trust and rapport with the clients, patients, community members that we serve. And this is so fundamental. Like any kind of healthcare practitioner or therapist, physician, nurse, social worker, psychoanalyst, whatever the case, the trust and the therapeutic relationship between the provider and the recipient of care is so, so, so important. And I would argue what truly separates the music therapy realm from other types of music and health work are the clinical goals that are informed by our training. So we do look at development, health, and well-being from a fairly clinical perspective. I'm looking at the people whom I work with and I'm thinking, what are your primary needs in this moment? I do an assessment and I work together with the patient to come up with the most uh, pressing and important clinical goals, which I'll speak about a little bit later. So my succinct definition of music therapy is that top sentence you see on your screen, music within a therapeutic relationship to address clinical goals. And typically these goals are not musical. I'm not really working with patients to help them to learn an instrument, although sometimes that might happen as a result. The clinical goals that I'm talking about are listed in bullet points in the middle of your screen. I work with things like pain and symptom management. I look at emotional support. I look at psycho-spiritual processing, which could mean a combination of exploring emotions, spirituality, where people find meaning in their lives. I use music as a mood enhancer, stabilizer, and a mood changer. Part of my work has a lot to do with grief and bereavement. I often work in palliative care, so I'm often working with family members who are anticipating the loss of a loved one or who have just experienced the loss of a loved one. Music is a beautiful form of creative self-expression, and sometimes that in and of itself is the goal. Much of my day is often spent discussing relaxation strategies and distraction strategies through music, and I do this through live music at the bedside, but I also offer techniques and tools for the patients I work with. I do a lot of songwriting, and I also do a fair bit of support for those who choose a medically assisted death, which is a procedure that became legalized in Canada around 2015. As music therapists, we work in so many different places. Like truly, the scope of practice is so broad and we work with a number of different populations. Apologies for the busy slide. I really wanted to give a, a really rich snapshot of all of the different ways in which music therapists work in a brief period of time here. So we are, uh, I like to say, across every age and every range and every stage of life. From neonatal intensive care to older adults and palliative and end of life care and everything in between. Wherever people are receiving health care, there is room for music therapy. I personally work in oncology, so cancer care, and palliative and end of life care, predominantly in a cancer care hospital in downtown Toronto, Princess Margaret. As Dawn so kindly mentioned, I do have a private practice as well in Midtown Toronto and online where I see a similar population, but I also work with individuals who are navigating life and the ups and downs that life brings us, uh, anxiety, depression, life transitions, coping with stress, coping with loss, coping with change. How I work is one modality, uh, one snapshot, if you will, of how music therapists work in hospitals. And I work in a medical music therapy model, which I will speak about on my next slide. But I think it's important to acknowledge that music therapists in hospitals may work in a variety of different ways. 
Of course, there is the music therapy model that is uh, highly medical in nature, which again, I will describe in a moment. But also, there are music therapists who specialize in rehabilitation, which is very different from what I do. There's still a medical perspective, of course, but the goals, the clinical goals, tend to be more rehabilitative in nature. I'm thinking of my colleagues who do neurologic music therapy, NMT, which is a huge scope of practice for music therapists, focusing predominantly on cognitive, speech and language, and sensory motor rehabilitation for individuals who have a number of brain uh, challenges, injuries, diseases, and require support rehabilitating certain functions. This is quite different from the work I do as a registered psychotherapist, which is the second arm of my training. So I have training as a music therapist, as well as a psychotherapist. I combine those two to look very closely with patients at their emotional connection to music and to support them in whatever their illness trajectory brings them. But I use music to tap into their emotions. This is quite different than using music to functionally rehabilitate someone's motor movement or speech and language capacity. Music therapists in hospitals, including myself, do a lot of teaching. We often have interns who are training in a specific area of music therapy. I also teach at the University of Toronto for uh, music students who are interested globally in the work of music therapy, but aren't necessarily going to go down a training path. And of course, research. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are today without huge amounts of research and many, many music therapists who have uh, a very rich background in the research tradition in hospital settings. And I feel very proud to be able to contribute a little bit on that front. Medical music therapy is an umbrella term. And again, apologies for a slightly busy slide here, but I hope you sense the breadth and depth through a snapshot of what this can mean for a hospital setting. In my role as a medical music therapist, if we start at the top of our screen on the left, I provide comprehensive psychosocial care within the context of a team. So I work very closely with the nurses, doctors, social workers, psychiatrists, cleaning staff, truly nutritionists. I work with the respiratory therapists. We work together to discuss different patient needs and then we work directly with the patients to decide on what course of action is best for them. And if we go to the middle at the top, there is a fair bit of research that informs what I do, but I also feel proud, like I said, to contribute to the research. Some of my personal research is specifically in medical assistance and dying and music therapy, adolescents and young adults with cancer experiencing music therapy. And there's some other adjacent areas that I'm tapping into at the moment, but uh, predominantly those are my areas of interest. If we move to the right, I also support families and caregivers through joint sessions, meaning they are often present at the bedside with their loved ones as they have a music therapy session. If we move to the bottom of your screen, I do incorporate psychotherapy, which is a talk-based therapy predominantly, and I look at supporting the whole person, their physicality, emotionality, their mental, cognitive, and spiritual health, not just their emotional health, not just their physical health. I love providing staff support. This is such an integral component of how I work because as we may know through experience, but I think have all heard about and seen and experienced in some way, uh, healthcare practitioners are really struggling and our healthcare system relies on them. So anything I can do to contribute to the wellness of the staff um, feels very, very important. I also, as I mentioned, offer educational support for trainees. Uh, as I believe this is the basis of the changing culture of healthcare that we are moving towards. I want to briefly take you through how I get to know who to see in the hospital setting. I only see inpatients, people who are admitted to the hospital for at least one night, if not more. I get a referral from somebody on the interdisciplinary team, be it a physician, a nurse, uh, an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, etc. I do an assessment of the person's needs. I then do the music therapy intervention with the patient's consent and permission, of course. And then I evaluate how, what was the outcome? How did that go? I use a range of musical interventions. And as noted, the therapeutic relationship is absolutely paramount. 
Uh, this picture was taken pre-pandemic, and I love this picture because central to the picture is the patient, and you see the interdisciplinary team literally and figuratively around the patient. And this was taken on the day of his discharge. But the cool thing is, I've now labeled who is present, and it's all of these people and so many more who take care of the patient. It's this idea of surrounding the patient with all of our different areas of expertise and working together to support uh, optimal health care. So what does a session actually look like? I play live music 99% of the time. Occasionally, a patient really wants to hear a recording and we listen to the recording together and use that as a springboard. But most of the time I wheel into a room with my cart, which has a keyboard. That's my primary instrument is piano uh, and a number of other instruments. And we play, I play for people with people in tandem with parallel to Sometimes patients play instruments, sometimes we write songs, sometimes we create playlists, sometimes we do things like legacy work, sharing thoughts, dreams, and ideas for the future where a patient knows they may not be present because they have a terminal illness. I do a lot of lyric analysis, and of course, all of this is punctuated by uh, my skills in verbal psychotherapy, because often patients really want to talk about what they feel in the music. And before I pass the baton to my lovely colleague, Nick, I'd like to share two examples from the bedside. So you can hear some uh, actual stories of how this works and what this looks like. So I'm going to take you back to this picture, which we saw earlier in my slide presentation. And I also want to say um, I'm delighted that there'll be lots of time for questions as I'm sort of uh, speed reading through uh, so many different components of this very complex work, I'm very excited to dialogue with you. So please, please, if you have questions, uh, know that there will be time for those. This is Joanne. And Joanne gave me permission to tell her story. She was a really excellent fiddle player. And before she became acutely ill, she would be playing. She'd be playing in her hospital room. She'd have tons of musician friends come and visit her. And they would play and play and play and I also love to play the fiddle. I'm not half the fiddler she was, but we played together. And in the moments where she became so unwell that she was unable to play, she loved holding her fiddle. And when she became unable to hold her fiddle, she wanted me to play for her. So we kind of spanned the gamut of playing together. Familiar tunes, improvisations. Um, she spoke a lot about her relationship to music and told me about the people in her life that um, really made the music special. And it was very special to be able to share music with her in the midst of being hospitalized. And this is on the palliative care unit where clearly her oxygen needs were very, very high due to her deteriorating lungs, but she was still able to connect through music in so many different ways. And finally, this is Rick. And uh, I love telling Rick's story. This actually goes back 10 years. Rick really, really wanted to play the violin, but had never picked up a violin before in his life. And these happened to be two violin dominant stories. Uh, I don't play the violin as much these days in sessions, but Rick said, Sarah Rose, I want to learn how to play the violin. And I said, well, that sounds great. I th that It might take some time, but we could do it. But tell me, like, why? And he said, well, I want to play the piece of music that my wife walked down the aisle to. And I said, well, what's that piece? And he said, it's Pachelbel's Canon in D. Do you know the piece? And I said, of course I know the piece. I love the piece. I'm internally panicking because it's not an easy piece to play on the violin, but he was determined. And for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it's beautiful, fast moving, um, gorgeous string arrangements of this piece. And he said, no, I, uh, we're going to figure it out. I'm going to play it because I want to play it for her as a thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for me to help me through my illness, to support me every step of the way through the uncertainty. Rick was so unwell in this particular picture. It took a lot of effort for him to stand up with the fiddle and take the picture, but he really wanted to. What I did was I taught him how to hold it and to play an open D string. And as he bowed the open D, I played the melody of Pachelbel's Canon. We recorded it. And I kid you not, he ordered this violin off of Amazon. We had to put it together one piece at a time, but he was so determined. Rick died two weeks after this picture was taken, but this was so, so, so important to him to have this as legacy, as a way of creatively self-expressing his love for his wife beyond words. And to this day, I get emails from his wife reflecting on his life uh, and her experiences in memory of his legacy. 
So music therapy permeates time, space, ability, and truly connects people across lifetimes. So I'm so honored to be able to share these two stories. And on that note, I'd like to pass the baton to my lovely colleague, Nick. Thank you so much, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Sarah. It's always wonderful to hear you talk about your incredible work. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, just bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, hopefully you're seeing my slides. <laughs> So good evening, as it is in the UK right now. Um, it's uh, lovely to join you all. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you to uh, Room 217 for having me to this webinar. It's lovely to join everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our work as healthcare musicians. Um, I want to take some time just to look at the scope of this practice, um, to look at some short video examples as well. I'd like the uh, the patients and their, their families uh, to to uh, tell you a little of the, of the story themselves as well. Um, and also maybe to present a few models in which we might be able to understand um, what this role is about and maybe its relationship to um, other roles that we're, we're looking at, including uh, the role of the music therapist. Um, so uh, just very briefly about myself. Um, I'm a healthcare musician. I'm the chief executive of Opus Music, which is a community interest company, and I'm a trainer. Uh, I trained as a healthcare musician and as a trainer between so around 2009 and 2011 um, through European partnerships led by uh, the brilliant Music Isante in Paris, uh, in France, uh, and the Royal Northern College of Music in the UK, alongside other partners is in Ireland, Poland and Finland uh, and a glorious um, programme of exploration across Europe it was too. Um, as an organisation, um, as a community interest company, Opus Music specialises in taking music into health and social care spaces um, and I'm going to share some of that work with you today. So very briefly, our mission as an organisation is to champion the use of music to connect and transform the lives of all people within health and social care. And we do this through our practice um, as healthcare musicians, um, as trainers, um, for which we have programmes for musicians and we have programmes, um, we, we deliver music care training as well in the UK. Um, and as advocates for the use of music uh, within health and social care. Our vision is where music is an intrinsic part of health and social care everywhere. And that's our passion. It's, it drives us forward, both in our delivery and in our training work. So let's dive into this role of the healthcare musician. Uh, and it's important to say, I think from the outset, that we're not trained uh, as music therapists. Myself and my colleagues at Opus Music, CIC, uh, don't have music therapy training. Um, there are people, um, particularly within the UK, that do work um, as healthcare musicians and are also trained as music therapists, uh, as, as music therapists, um, and use those different modalities um, as required by the client or the group with, with which they're working. Um, I think it's important to say as well that we really have a deep understanding of the, both the impacts and of the boundaries within our working practices. So what do we do uh, as healthcare musicians? Well, we take music uh, music making into health and social care spaces. And for us, that's um, similarly to Sarah Rose Black in her, um, her wonderful description of music therapy. It's right from neonatal intensive care through to through children, through adults, and through to healthcare of the older person. So really quite a, across the whole breadth of uh, the hospital settings in which we work. And here's um, an image from one of the hospital settings in which we work. Uh, this image, you can see um, myself on the right and my colleague 
on the left, uh, Sarah Matthews, um, making a mu making music alongside a young musician uh, in a high dependency unit um, at Children's Hospital. And you can see there that Sarah and this young musician are sharing the happy drum, um, hand activated percussion instrument, um, one of the instruments that we like to use uh, within our practice. I'm also just going to very briefly show to you as well, just to show the scope of our practice. Um, we also work in community uh, and you can see a range of instruments that we use in our practice uh, alongside, of course, the ever important plate of biscuits. Um, it's always important to have that in place as well. Um, we uh, work with our communities um, to create music together, to be musicians together. And through the act of music making together, we can focus on an increased sense of autonomy and self-efficacy, uh, a connection to identity, um, to our likes and dislikes, and to the wider world beyond the hospital or the community. And I think critically, uh, and really most importantly in our work, um, to connection and communication. Something that we do as, um, as healthcare musicians is um, to, to address the person rather than the patient or the illness. We often don't know very much, um, if anything, of a person's diagnosis or their condition, their illness. Uh, and this really places us as healthcare musicians in a unique position to see and work with the person. Uh, and it also means that we represent sometimes a kind of welcome reprieve from the clinical world. And uh, we're opening up that that space, that cultural space for people to be in. So I'm going to um, just share with you a two minute um, film, a short case study of Kyle uh, and his mum uh, and their encounters uh, in um, with with healthcare musicians. Kyle's been in hospital now for four weeks, so we've seen him um, quite a few times. And Ara, it's really uplifting and it chills Kyle out. Um, before they come in, Kyle will get a bit boisterous. He's a little lad, he gets boisterous. Uh, but you're seeing that when they come in, he, he joins in with them, he sings with them, and it really is good. And it calms him down and it's uplifting. It makes me, I love it, I do come in because I know that they're going to be here. What we saw today was actually somebody who's been in hospital for quite a long time with quite a bit of energy and frustration. Um, not necessarily able to express that in the way that you or I might be able to uh, and to release that. But actually, us being there as musicians was an opportunity for him to, to say, this is me, this is who I am, this is my... This is me being quite lively and, and quite strong and quite bold. What we find a lot happens um, for children in hospital is that their autonomy is taken away from them. That by no fault of any of the hospital staff, uh, that they're no longer in control of what's happening, the day-to-day -day things that are happening. Um, they don't get much choice in what's going to happen next. And if we can come along and just give that little bit of control, give a little bit of autonomy back, it can be incredibly empowering um, and can give that child a real sense of purpose, a real sense of um, self-worth and self-value that then goes on into their, their care beyond that point. When I see him looking good, it makes my day good. When they sing that Don't Worry, Be Happy, he loves that song, that's one of his favourite songs. And every time they come in, they always sing that song for him because they know it's his favourite. When you've got them coming in, it brightens up your day, definitely. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, I apologise, but I think my video has has, has disappeared. <laughs> my image. I shall try and fix my my camera. Yes. Are you still hearing me? Okay. Yeah, we're hearing you, and I have your beautiful background, Nick. We just don't see yes. you. the lovely you. <laughs> I've given away given away the secret that it's not a real not a real background, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it works. Uh, for I me. do apologize. I will try and fix my camera uh, when we next have a, a video clip. Um, 
I think uh, Kyle speaks for himself <laughs> in that uh, that that uh, case study. Um, I also want to um, to present that the healthcare musician really takes a holistic view of the person. Um, uh, what do I mean by that? Um, but I think working as a musician with clients in the healthcare space who become musicians with us enables a very holistic approach to health and well-being. It's um, the relationship with it that we have. Sarah Rose was describing that therapeutic relationship. Uh, we have a, a relationship where we are musicians together in that space. And that really enables that holistic approach um, to care. And here's the model, uh, which is Room 217's zone model of of, uh, of holistic care. Uh, and it really uh, is a great example, uh, a great way of looking. Um, and the modality in which we're working, we're able to have our eyes open really to those impacts, um, psychological or biological, on the social, emotional, spiritual and cognitive domains. Uh, most importantly, we don't address those in isolation. And I also want to talk uh, a little bit about um, how um, workers, a healthcare musician might also address the space and all the people within it. Um, so healthcare staff members tell us about th their favorite day is when we visit. Uh, it makes them feel um, so much calmer uh, and gives them pride in their work and in their work workplace. And so I've got another short um, video to show you um, to illustrate a little bit of what I mean by that. Basically, when you come here, your child is unwell. They've done tests, they've taken bloods, we've had an operation, and they still can't work out what's actually wrong with her. So I've spent 10 days waiting before they try another type of treatment to see if what's wrong with her. At the same time, not actually fixing her, but doing lots of things that are quite invasive to her and in a way traumatizing her. Um, but they have no choice because it's not obvious what's wrong with her. So how was I feeling this morning? I was sitting here feeling very, very tired after many nights here. And they started, they played a, a song I think called Swan Something and it almost made me cry because I thought they'd come and play yippity music and children's music and actually they played a song um, that was really charming and lovely and very gentle. And they played it, Primrose was actually off in a wheelchair with one of the staff and there was no child here but they still chose to play for me and that was really nice. And then when Primrose came back, and she was involved and she played, it'll be the highlight of her day. Um, because most of this, no matter how lovely the staff are, this is very monotonous and a very trapped environment and a highlight and something that engages and makes them smile and play without giving them a present is, um, is really, really nice. So how do I feel they've left? I feel happy. They've made me feel happy. Basically, when you come here, you're Thank you. Um, I'm still battling to get my video back. I, I will. I will get it back eventually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hopefully, you can see from that that video that our work is full of intention uh, and responsiveness to the space and the people within it, and the situations that they find themselves in. I finally like to just um, talk a little bit about how we connect to sharing a gift of music. Uh, and it's sharing, it's that sharing of music together as musicians together, or of people who experience music together that is really important. And our offer feels like to everyone a gift of music, it's something which we can unwrap and play with together. And it's not owned or controlled by any one person, but something with which we can all play a part. And uh, I have one final, very short video clip to illustrate that.
both can you cook you? Say again? Both can you cook you? <laughs> And I think what you can, um, it's, it's hard to make out, but I think the gentleman was there saying something akin to you have a gift. Uh, and Sarah, my colleague, says it's a gift I'm happy to share. And I think that is a really um, nice way to, to sum up what some of this practice is about. Uh, and very quickly, just want to share a couple of models that might help us to understand about the way different roles might, um, might interact with each other. Uh, and this Venn diagram here we're representing three roles and there are overlaps in approaches and things that we've heard about this evening about overlaps. And indeed, sometimes from the outside, this work might look the same, um, though the intention, outcomes and training required to pursue these outcomes is very different. And I mentioned earlier that those with appropriate training might well change between those modalities as required. However, it really is crucial that each role and the nature of the relationship between people in the space is carefully bounded and that the intention in the action is clear. Um, we have just spent a lovely training week with uh, musicians in the UK, um, working with them um, to explore the role of healthcare musicians. And very much of that is around these boundaries, what role we can play and where those boundaries, boundaries sit and, and exploring the skills and competencies to um, to explore all the things that we've seen um, examples of today. And finally, uh, another model um, from one of my European training peers, um, Dr. Jane Bentley, who uh, has explored a spectrum of many musics and many possibilities. And it classifies the use of music from unintentional background music through to musical interaction. And poses that levels of specialism and training and flexibility are required to deliver this. And it can be a useful model to consider where and how our respective music making practices might converge or might diversify, but that they can all fit within this same kind of model. And what we work towards really, and um, what I think we should be working towards is a world where we can employ the power of music appropriately and selecting from these different practices to the benefit of those who need it most. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. And uh, as uh, Sarah Rose also said, I'll be very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you to both of you um, for the information. It's really quite fascinating to see um, how they're similar, how they're different, how music can be shared. Um, and I just want to say, I think before... Um, before we get into questions to both of you to the people that allowed you to share your story both through pictures and the storytelling and videos just I think on behalf of our organization and just on behalf of those that might watch in the future thank you for that it it does really um help us conceptualize it when we have examples and pictures you know when you see that and I know those aren't always easy things to share so please pass along our thanks to the families of those people of which you shared Nick, how is the camera coming? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. It doesn't want to start. It's it, it's it's really misbehaving. It's amazing how they pick their moment in these things, isn't it? It, it <laughs> I is. Keep it, working on it. That's <laughs> I okay. Keep multitasking. <laughs> yeah, you keep doing that, and I'm going to start maybe with Sarah Rose uh, <laughs> with some questions. If there are any questions, by the way, please feel free to um, turn your camera on, throw it into the chat. We'll monitor that as well. But again, uh, two two different models. Uh, Nick's experience coming in from the UK from healthcare musicians, and Sarah Rose um, more from your experience in Canada here in um, as a music therapist. Um, and I'm just I'm just wondering, um, in terms of your role, like I you know you talked to us a little bit about the referral, which was kind of interesting, the process and such. But what would um, and you've you've shown us the work you do, but out of curiosity, in a hospital setting, like what is a day in the life of a music therapist? Like what take us through that? That's a great question, Don, and a question that often comes up, like what are the logistics of moving through a day in a hospital as a music therapist? Typically, my day starts with interdisciplinary rounds, which is a meeting during which, a number of healthcare providers on a particular team will systematically talk through every patient on a particular floor. So I typically start with palliative care, 
So I'll be there at 9.30 in the morning, all of us gather, and we talk through every patient who is admitted. What are their current pressing needs? How was their night overnight? What's coming up for them today? Are there any new referrals? Do we have to have a conversation about anything in particular that is pressing? And typically I get referrals from those conversations. Uh, I then triage my day. I look at my uh, the medical system that we have. Uh, I often get online referrals through different healthcare practitioners. So they show up on my screen, uh, A, B, C, D. I look at them and I say, okay, well, who needs me first? And I have a pretty systematic way of triaging. If somebody is in a pain crisis, if somebody is actively dying, those are sort of my top two reasons for uh, supporting somebody urgently. And then I look at how, when's the last time this person had a session? Is there anybody else on the psychosocial team following them? Do they have a social worker, psychiatrist, or spiritual care provider? Yes. Okay, that's great. No, maybe I need to go a little bit sooner. Then I go see patients. Uh, my sessions can last anywhere from five minutes to an hour and a half. My longest session record, um, it, was, it was a unique situation, it was about four hours long. And my shortest sessions are a couple of minutes. I see my patients, I circle through the hospital, I connect with staff along the way. I try and take time sometimes to learn new pieces of music for patients. Uh, and then of course I have to chart as one of the healthcare providers, I have to document everything I've done. That gets peppered in with research and uh, teaching on different days of the week, but technically that's that's a day in the life. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to come back with some questions and, and again, jump in if anybody does. But now, Nick, I'm going to ask you the same question. And here we see you. Your camera is working. <laughs> Great to have yeah. you back. Can you walk us through a day in the life of a healthcare musician? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think um, we we visit uh, a variety of different hospitals and, and it's, it's different in each. Um, but um, typically, we would uh, arrive and take uh, and arrive early so that we we have time. And um, often we work in pairs uh, and support each other uh, in that way. Um, we, we um, in a sense, supervise each other in that uh, in that approach. Um, but we arrive early and, and settle into the or, or get rid of the the journey and the, everything that's happened <laughs> before we arrived. So that we can be in that space with 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 patients um, in an appropriate way, uh, and we take referrals in the same way. But it's it's referrals from um, again multidisciplinary team that we work with and uh, that identify for as patients that they know they know our practice they know our practice as healthcare musicians and they know those that will really enjoy engaging as musicians with us. Uh, so we get referrals to those patients. Um, Sometimes we arrive in a space that we're invited to and we just simply make an offer of music, um, a few notes or something really gently offered to somebody. And we we follow, you know, the response to that offer is where we go with that. And it can be it can be a no. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. I don't want any music right now. It it, it isn't usually <laughs> and we don't very often get that. But actually that sense that somebody can say no this isn't for me uh is incredibly empowering and incredibly important for somebody to have that choice mm -hmm. um but we we then you know engage in in a process of music making and that spectrum that we saw from jane bentley uh is a wonderful way of you know of where are we going to go with this is this about interacting is it around singing together is it about you know something really co closely connected to to you and your uh, the way you are right now and the way you're feeling and, and sharing music together from that from that that source um, but it is about us being musicians together in that moment yeah. and so in your uh just a question um for you nick so are you if you're working in pairs or partners my question would be do you like do you work with the same people how would you develop a repertoire together like is it um, so? I guess the the skills or techniques on the musician side for a healthcare musician um, is is there a, is it practiced or is this improvised? Is it? <laughs> it's it's a, it's a, a lot of both, <laughs> yeah. um, and often we start with um, with music that that a a, a person might um, bring to us through through instruments that we share with them. And that might be a starting point for music making. Uh, as as a team here at Opus, we've worked together 
and now um since uh, for some of us since 2002 <laughs> we we know uh, each other musically uh, um, very very well uh, and know what each other is thinking um, in much the same way that um clinical members of staff have the same <laughs> way of working they know what each other's thinking what what direction they're going to go with care um so we, uh, we have a lot of repertoire uh, a lot of pieces that we use um, but we're also very comfortable with that notion of creating music in the moment to suit that situation Fantastic. And then just, is there, um, is, is there a, a, a time ish of the visit? I know like Sarah Rose, it probably could yeah. extremely vary, <laughs> but is there a general, as a healthcare musician, is there a general process to that? The, the, um, we, we may spend um, 30 seconds with somebody. We, we may spend half an hour with somebody. Yeah. Um, the, the, the constraints of our work mean that we, in a sense we uh, we are we have to get around spaces and, and meet as many as people as we can and uh, that kind of you know justice of, of of sharing those scarce resources is really quite important um so that's something that you know we're really we're really mindful of um but we're also mindful of giving people time to to explore music when that's a, a, a strong benefit to them yeah and i guess to both maybe this is a question to think about um uh, and again, I'm going to jump in. Does anybody have any questions in the chat? I don't see any. If you do, please jump in. Um, now's the chance to ask these two very uh, incredibly talented people and, and uh, leaders in their own domain. Um, but I, I have to ask too, I, we're talking mostly about a hospital setting. That's what's different than, you know, about this webinar than some of the others. And I have to imagine hospitals are huge spaces. And, you know, I guess, I'm just curious, it, it's kind of shocking to me that there would be a music therapist for Princess Margaret or maybe a couple of you, Nick, that might work as healthcare musicians. I mean, maybe this is an unfair question for me to ask of you, but I, is there um, just your thoughts on that and of advocacy? I can imagine that when you come in, the referrals would be extensive, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's an ongoing challenge, I think, for music therapists, certainly across the country, I'm sure across the world. But I often um, have these conversations with colleagues, just how do you manage? How do you say no or set boundaries when you're just one person? Fortunately, most other uh, major hospitals in the city have a team of music therapists. We're working on that at Princess Margaret, but it is challenging. Even with a team, there are... Um, there are issues around triage and there are issues around making sure everybody can get seen. Because I think the ideal, the thing that we're striving towards is that everybody has access. To Nick's point, when somebody says no to me, I see that as a wonderful exercise of autonomy at a time when there is so little that patients can say no to. Uh, certainly, technically, they can say no to anything, but there is a bit of an impetus to like, you have to take this medication. We, we have to do this procedure and it's going to be uncomfortable. Do you want music? You know what? Not right now. And that's empowering. However, however, to be able to offer it more regularly feels like a really important, most ethical piece that I, I really hope we can implement um, absolutely at Princess Margaret. But may music therapy and music in general be a standard of healthcare, as I love to say, um, at some point in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you for that. Nick, any other thoughts too from the lens of healthcare musicians? Yeah, I I suppose a really interesting thought just jumped into my head. What is interesting to me is 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 the the the, the perspective that actually it's 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 a different relationship that we have with um funding even about the way we work. Our work is funded um primarily through charitable and through arts funding. Uh, rather than through, through health funding um, and we there's a, a huge movement in the UK uh, around um, social prescribing and around the importance of the arts for health and well-being so I guess we're in a in a in a strong position in a sense um, to approach this from the arts side rather than the clinical side uh, that said we are still a scarce resource um, <laughs> what is always lovely to to see is um is to see our um, ex-apprentices and trainees 
working in similar spaces and working in the same spaces as um you know we work at a nottingham children's hospital and uh, one of our ex-apprentices works uh, with a healthcare the older person in that same hospital uh and we 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 meet over lunch and 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 supervise each other uh, so you know there's a real strength to to the practice being based within the model that it's within Wonderful. And how, I guess, in your, I'm thinking back to your Venn diagram there, Nick, how does the musical entertainer fit in into the context? I know maybe also Dr. Sarah Rose Black, you can talk about, I think there's music in the atrium or whatever, but how does that, how does that other, other circle fit in, Nick? Well, I think no one is, is, is greater than the other. <laughs> hmm. uh, everything, everything has a really important role to play um but it's the intention of what's behind it that is that is most important so you know if if music in the atrium is the most important thing for that moment then that is what should be done and i suppose you know in that venn diagram i'm not necessarily looking at the person it, it's it's the intention and the role that you're taking in that moment to suit where that space is and what the people in that space need mm -hmm. um and i think that's a really fascinating thing you know we tend to think of, of roles and people um but actually you know there's amazing work that we can do together when we consider what all the needs are and how we can address those needs musically thank you for that nick and i guess i guess on that note um thank you so much for joining us today i don't know if you have any if either of you have one other uh something that you want to share or or say on you know on behalf of um music therapy or healthcare musicking, um, things to look forward to, anything coming up, um, you know, that you know about. Oh, and Tanya is wondering if we can all get a picture. Um, and sorry, I, it, uh, if it's possible, if that's okay with you, we do like to advertise our future webinars. So if anybody um, would not like to be in the picture, I invite you to hop off right now. Um, but if you don't mind being on the picture, either by face or by name, if you could, uh, stay on so we could uh, advertise our webinars, if that's okay. Great, Tanya, are you gonna take the picture? Okay, great, oh, we have some people, thank you. There's people on the other side. Before we take the picture, is there any burning question? Nope, you covered it all. It's so fascinating, before we take the picture, I'll just say it's so fascinating to see how you work in the same space differently and, you know, both pay so much respect to each other. It's it's uh, it's fantastic. All right, Tanya, are you going to do a countdown? Yeah, is anybody else going to show some faces here? Anybody? Anybody? No? All right. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Great. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, Nick, in the UK. Also have a wonderful rest of your day, Sarah Rose, and to everybody else that's here. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye okay. now.